Brianna Zunino Dennison was born in the city of Reno, Nevada on March 29, 1998. Bridget Zunino Dennison was her mother, and she had a younger brother named Brighton. Brianna grew up in a family that loved her a lot. People say that her parents and other family members taught her good lessons about life. Jeff Dennison, her father, died when she was only six years old. She was known for putting other people's needs before her own. She loved kids and animals, especially her dog, Ozzy. Brianna went to Reno High School where she finished in June of 2006. After that, her family moved to Mendocino, California, where Brianna enrolled in the psychology faculty and chose child psychology as her major. She says that therapy helped her get over the death of her father when she was still a child, and that's why she decided to be a therapist. Brianna loved to travel and learn about the ways people live in other places. As a child, she lived in Rome, Italy for a year. Later, she lived in a few other places. Her family and close friends say that she was easy to get along with and make friends with. During her winter break in 2008, Brianna went to Reno, where she grew up. She always went to a snowboarding event in the city, which happened every year, and used the time to visit family and friends. On January 19, 2008, Brianna and her mother watched a movie together. After the movie, Brianna gave her mother a list of the things she planned to do that night and told her that she would spend the night at the home of her friend Kate Hunter, whom Brianna's family already knew. Brianna and Kate had been friends since high school, and when she went on vacation to the city, they always met up. Around 9 p.m., Brianna said goodbye to her mother and went to meet her friend. Then the two of them went to the fair. The girl's first stop was the Hotel Casino St. Regency, which was close to Kate's house. Then they took a bus to a show, which was the big event of the night. After the show, they went back to the hotel and had breakfast. Brianna had been to these events for the last three years in a row. Around 4 a.m., they left for Kate's house in McKay Court with four friends who dropped them off at the house and then left. After getting into her clothes at her friend's house, Kate gave Brianna two blankets, a pillow, and a teddy bear to keep the pillow safe. Brianna slept on the leather couch near the door downstairs, while Kate went upstairs to her shared room with another girl. Kate took her dog with her when she left the room and locked the door. As was her habit, the girl had left the front door of the house unlocked. Kate woke up at 9 a.m. and went to the living room to talk to Brianna, but she wasn't there. The friend searched the whole house for her, but couldn't find her. She took a closer look at the sofa where Brianna was sleeping and saw a small spot of blood on the pillow. She also saw that all of Brianna's things were still there, including her shoes, cell phone, bag with money, and ID, an ID card. Kate was very worried because it was very cold that morning, and Brianna shouldn't have left without her things, her clothes, or her shoes. Brianna was a very responsible girl, and if she had to go out at night for any reason, she would tell her friend. Kate then chose to tell Brianna's mother, Bridget. Bridget soon told the police that Brianna had gone missing. At the same time, the cops started a big investigation into how the girl went missing. People in the area started to pass around photos of Brianna, and they said that she was probably barefoot and only wearing a white shirt and sweatpants. Kate told the cops that after she went to her room, she didn't hear any noise and that her dog didn't bark. In the days that followed, the Reno Police Department did a forensic study of Katie's home. They found a man's DNA on the doorknob, but since it wasn't in their database, they couldn't figure out who it belonged to. After some lab tests, it was clear that Brianna's blood was on the pillow. Brianna may have hurt her mouth, throat, or nose by pressing her face so hard against the couch. There were no signs of a fight or a forced entry into the house, and one of the blankets Brianna was using was on the kitchen floor near the back door. Kate had put Brianna to sleep with a pet bear, but it couldn't be found. The house was on a busy street, and all the doors and windows were glass, so anyone who looked in could see Brianna sleeping on the couch. No one knew where Brianna could be, so the cops started to think she had been taken. Kate and Brianna's family members worked hard to help the police with their investigation. They didn't understand why the girl had gone missing and were very worried that no one had heard from her. Brianna's cell phone showed that she had sent and received several text messages before she went missing. The last one was at 4.23 a.m. Later, it came to light that she was talking to an ex-boyfriend who lived in Oregon. 
The police made a point of saying that her ex-boyfriend was not a suspect because he was in Oregon when she went missing. The University of Nevada was the first place police looked for her on January 21st, 2008, the day after she went missing. They got help from the University of Nevada at Reno, the FBI, the National Center for Missing Children, more than 1,500 volunteers, and even the First Lady of Nevada, who was one of the governor-elects at the time. Over the next few days, Reno police kept looking for Brianna. They used search teams, dogs, planes, and a 24-hour hotline to look near the university and in other isolated places nearby. Officers in uniform also went door-to-door -door in the neighborhood to see if anyone had seen or heard anything strange. Volunteers from northern Nevada went out in the harsh winter weather to look in different places, but they found nothing. Brianna's family worked hard to get the word out about her disappearance, which quickly became a national story. America's Most Wanted, which has a big audience, even covered the case. Donations helped the family raise more than $160,000 to pay for the DNA tests. Investigators later found that the male DNA they found where Brianna had been sleeping was linked to at least two other attacks in the same area. One happened on November 13, 2007, when a man attacked a 21-year-old girl who was going home, and the other happened on December 16, 2007, when the same person attacked a 22-year-old girl and knocked her out. After a few minutes, she woke up, and this man was already on top of her. After the attack, the person who did it took her home. She couldn't quite see his face, but she told the cops enough about him that they could draw a picture of what he looked like. The woman who was forced into the car told the officer who was working on Brianna's case that she was forced into an old pickup truck with an extended cab. It had seats that leaned back, gray or black upholstery and rugs, and adjustable headrests. The truck had an automatic transmission, and the victim noticed that the cabin lights were blue and were above the rearview mirror. She also said that she remembered seeing a baby shoe on the floor of the vehicle, and that because the truck was so tall, it took a big step to get in. Detective Jenkins took a description of the car to a few local auto body shops, but he found that the description fits several Toyota Tacoma 4WD pickup trucks made between 2001 and 2006. On January 29, 2008, the police put out a picture and some more details about the kidnapper. They also asked anyone who knew someone who looked like him to get in touch. The man was boring and wore a beard and goatee when he was in his 20s and 30s. Later, another woman called the cops and said she had been robbed at gunpoint in the university parking lot in October 2007. With the information she gave, the cops were able to put together this sketch of the attacker. All of these attacks happened at night and in the same area where Brianna had gone missing. Since the other victims were still alive, the police thought Brianna might be too. They started talking to about 100 suspects in their database who lived less than a mile from the scene, but got no answers. Authorities say that solving a case like this in the first 24 to 36 hours is very important. Each hour goes by, and the chances of finding the person living go down. On February 15, 2008, a guy named Albert Jimenez was on his way back to work after lunch. As he walked down the road, he saw a bright orange piece of fabric that stood out among three trees in a ditch in a field near Reno Business Park. As he got closer, he saw that the fabric was actually a pair of orange socks. He first thought it was a dummy, but it turned out to be the body of a woman. Albert had heard about Brianna's kidnapping, but he didn't think the victim looked like the pictures on the signs. The man didn't have a cell phone with him, so he went back to his workplace and called the cops from there. The cops got there quickly, and the autopsy on February 16, 2008, showed that the body found was indeed that of Brianna Dennison and that she had been strangled. The story also said that she might have died the same night she went missing. Katie's house was about eight miles away from where the body was found. Near Brianna's body, police found a piece of underwear and the DNA of an unknown lady. Police said that the piece of clothing did not belong to Brianna and could have been left near her body to insult detectives. Later, the police found out that the suspect was crazy about underwear. Then, they asked anyone who knew the shirt, because it was theirs to come forward so they could help find out who did it. Then, on November 1st, 2008, 
An unidentified tip told police in the city of Reno that a man named James Michael Biella, who was 27, had been acting very strangely since the crime started. Detectives went after James and asked him nicely for a DNA sample, but he denied having anything to do with the case and also refused to give a DNA sample. The agent also noticed that James was very nervous and didn't make eye contact with him. He also knew that James worked as a plumber near the university campus, but when asked, James denied this. That means James was living in the area when Brianna went missing. James was the main suspect because of his strange behavior. It was only a matter of time before the police could clear everything up, but since they had no physical proof against him, they had to let him go. Before we go any further, I want to say a few words about James Biella. James Michael Biella was born in Chicago, Illinois, on June 29, 1981. At age nine, he went to the city of Reno with his family. He later became known as a funny guy who took martial arts classes, but he was also known to have a short temper and some people called him a bully. After high school, he joined the Marine Corps and worked his way up to the rank of spare corporal. In 2001, he was kicked out of the service for using drugs. Back in Reno in 2002, James was arrested for threatening the neighbor of his ex-girlfriend with a knife. His ex-girlfriend got a protection order against him, and he pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge involving the knife in April 2003. James was given alcohol therapy and told not to talk to the victim for a year. No DNA samples were taken, though, because the crime was only a misdemeanor. After getting into trouble with the law before, he moved in with his new girlfriend, Carlene Harmon, and had a kid with her around 2002. They lived in Sparks, which is east of Reno. His neighbors said he was a nice, normal guy, and even the police officers who took martial arts classes with him didn't notice anything strange about him. Back to the case. On November 12th, detectives met with James's lover, Carlene. During the talk, they asked the boy a number of questions, such as where he was on the dates of the other crimes. She told the police that her relationship with James was very rocky and that James used to sleep outside for days at a time, using his truck as a sort of home. Carlene also said that a friend called the cops and told them what happened. She told this friend that she had found women's underwear in James's truck when they were driving back from Seattle, Washington in March, where James had gotten a job as a plumber. The girl said that when she asked him about the clothes, he told her that he had stolen them from a woman in a Washington laundry room. Carlene also said that James had recently sold his truck in Seattle and already had another car. The police were able to find this car and took it to Reno for a forensics check. James's girlfriend agreed to let them take a DNA sample from their four-year-old son so they could match it to the DNA found at the crime scene. The study showed that the child's DNA was similar to the one that was found. This meant that the person who committed the crime was a direct relative of the boy. The Reno cops got a warrant to arrest James Biella on November 25, 2008. When he went to pick up his son from daycare, the police arrested him. James was charged with many crimes and taken to the Asheville County Jail. Investigators got a court order to take James's DNA after he was arrested. On November 26, 2008, at a press conference held by the Reno Police Station, it was said that James's DNA matched the DNA found at the crime scene, linking him to the crime that happened to Brianna Jennison and the three other cases. During his trial, James's mother, Kathy Lovell, said that her son's childhood was hard because his father was a drinker and violent. Lawyers for the defense used this to their advantage by saying that the defendant was a useful part of society before he committed the crimes and was a model prisoner. The jurors didn't buy any of these reasons, and after nine hours of deliberation on June 2, 2010, they found James Biella guilty on all counts and sentenced him to death. On July 30, 2010, James Biella got four more life terms from Judge Robert Perry. He tried to avoid the death sentence by going to the Nevada Supreme Court more than once, but each time his appeal was turned down. James Michael Biella is waiting for his execution at Nevada's Eli State Prison. The crime not only shocked everyone in the area, but it also caused people to buy guns to protect themselves. Some gun shop owners near the University of Nevada say that sales of not just guns, but also knives and pepper spray have increased. The crime also led to a rule in the state of Nevada called Brianna. 
This rule says that anyone who is arrested for a crime must have their DNA put into a police database. This way, if the same person commits a more serious crime in the future and leaves their DNA at the scene, they can be found and arrested faster. People who pass by the place where Brianna's body was found often leave flowers there to remember her. In February 2008, there was a memorial for the young woman at the Reno Sparks Convention Center. Brianna's family started the Bring Bree Back Foundation, which is symbolized by blue ribbons. Its goal is to use all available resources to help the community and their families learn more about violent crimes, personal safety, and getting justice. Brianna's family will never get over what happened, but at least the criminal will spend the rest of his life in jail. So, that's it, folks. Thank you so much for staying until the end, and I'll see you again soon.